So I act as the product manager for Google's uh, security team, though I'm primarily focused on internet identity issues. Been there about uh, seven years, so I'm gonna run through a couple different areas where I think there's some interesting overlaps with previous discussions we've had today about how to get some of the consumer internet players and some of the telcos to work together a little bit better. Let me talk about some of the incentives that, that we have. Uh, so we've talked a, a bit today about you know uh, identity frameworks, federation, open ID technology, et cetera. Uh, let me, within this room, tell you what tends to motivate big web mail providers like Google, AOL, Hotmail. About two years ago, we noticed uh, huge increases in account hijacking of the accounts that we offer for free. And when those accounts get hijacked, the people contact us trying to get back in. Uh, that's actually become one of the largest costs of operating a email service, so a free email service, is helping people recover stolen accounts. The primary reason the accounts are now getting stolen, it's not phishing, it's not even malware, it's that users log into other websites with the exact same email and password that they use to log into their email provider, and the hackers break into those sites. Right? So from our perspective, the more websites out there asking users for email address, the more screwed we are from a cost perspective. Uh, we all recognize this around the same time, the webmail providers, and so we got together and said, all right, you know, we've been talking about federated login for years, darn, I guess we're actually going to have to do it. You know, this, this is going to take some work. Uh, most of us got involved in the OpenID community and then the OpenID Foundation uh, to actually press forward and actually make that happen. Could spend hours talking you know, about that segment, but I wanted you to understand sort of you know, what our drivers are for some of the other slides. And we have people like you know, Don from the OpenID Foundation and OIX, we can talk about that more. Why don't you go on to the next slide? So uh, I mentioned you know, we have this problem, a lot of account hijacking. So one thing we want to do, as I said, use OpenID, try to stop users from re-entering their password on lots of websites. That's one part of it. But at the end of the day, people's accounts are still going to get stolen. Uh, it's just unavoidable. And it used to be we tried to help them recovering this by asking them secret questions and answers or having a backup email address. Percentage-wise, those just don't work that well. And I got to tell you, um, when people have their account stolen, they fall into one of two categories. Either we help them get their account back, in which case they want to kiss our feet. I mean, it has the photos of all their kids from the last five years, or we don't enable them to get their account back. And they are pissed beyond belief. They call up the press. They call their friends. They call up their senators and congressmen, to be honest, you know, when this happens. And so the industry has been you know, trying to experiment, OK, what, what are better ways to help users uh, recover the access to their accounts? And what we've actually, as an industry, have found that the best way is to rely on the telcos. Uh, we are asking more and more of our users, associate a phone number with your account. If your account gets you know, hijacked, your password is stolen. Great. Well, the chances are your phone hasn't been stolen, whether it's a home phone or more likely a cell phone. And so we're now you know, riding on top of the identity framework of the telcos without you know, any close partnership, just having that phone number, you know, call out to the user, hey, you know, here's a code, type it on the computer, we know it's you. Right? So there's immediate opportunities there to do things better. Because I got to tell you, those people who are ecstatic when we recover their account, if we do it with their phone number, they all of a sudden recognize the value proposition there. When the user first signs up for an email account and we ask them for their phone number, they're like, what, why, what, what the heck's going on? If we recover their account by using their phone number, they, they, they make the connection in their head and they're like, oh my god, my telco provider is my identity provider. It never even occurred to me. But that's actually you know, what it is. So there's some you know, opportunity there for the telcos to get some credit. Well, we move on to the next slide. Uh, so you know, most of us, when we log into websites, we're used to doing it with just passwords you know, by themselves. Uh, probably many of y'all within this room have heard the concept of doing two-factor authentication. Log in with something you know, like a password, and something that you have. Uh, it's an area where the industry has tried to get uh, more success over the last few, you know, maybe 10 years, and honestly, not too successful. Uh, most of the success the last few years came from uh, the online banks who were really pressured to do better here. And they tried a whole bunch of different approaches. And to be honest, thank God they did because I'm copying what worked for them and not doing what failed for them. And what ended up working for them was taking that sort of same approach of let's find out a user's phone number. And if a user goes in and logs on a computer I've never seen before, like why are they in Europe? You know, normally they're in California. Then I'll tell the user, oh, well, the password's right, but you know, let me verify you have access to that phone. You know, send a you know SMS message to a call them, et cetera. And only if they do that do I let them in. Uh, Google announced a few months ago we're making this service available to our enterprise users already. Consumer users is scheduled for like two weeks from now. Microsoft, Yahoo are also you know working towards this. And you know, there's two things here. The, the first is using phone numbers is the key. 
Um, but the second one is actually smartphones. So one of the big problems with using phones as your you know, backup is, well, what if you don't have a, a signal? What if you did travel to Europe and you, you know, forgot to buy you know, an international roaming plan? And so what we found is you can get users to install apps on their phones that have the ability to generate one-time codes to prove that, yes, they are, in fact, in control of that. So when you actually see our marketing to consumers about, hey, do you want to protect your account? The marketing is actually saying, great, make sure you have a smartphone. If you don't, you shouldn't use this service. Because if you don't, and say you travel to Europe, and we say, sorry, you can't log in to access your email unless you have your phone, again, users get pissed at us. They're like, you're keeping me from getting into my mail. Right? That, that's unacceptable. So we're actually only targeting this at users who have smartphones. And we're telling people, if you don't have a smartphone, well, go and get one if you want a strong identity on the internet. Right? That's going to be our message to users. Why don't we go into the next slide? Uh, so that, that's some of the things that have, um, you know, a couple opportunities there to work with telcos. Another one, let me switch from identity in terms of login to a, a different concept of identity, these social identities, these, um, you know, online profiles. Uh, obviously a popular thing these days, whether it's LinkedIn, MySpace, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, people want to publish more information about themselves. But, you know, obviously you need to be able to find that person's profile. On Facebook, you find it by pulling in the email addresses of all your contacts in your address book. And Facebook uses the email address as a key to, you know, find your friends. Or maybe you navigate, you know, through some social hierarchy. But in general, email address is used as a key. Uh, what we're finding, especially, honestly, in more the developing world is People don't associate themselves as strongly with their email address as they do with their phone number. They would really like people to be able to find them just based on their phone number. They'd like to be able to you know, hand them a business card. Here's my phone number, and if you go on the internet and do a Yahoo search for me, a Google search for my phone number, there is a set of information I want to be public to the entire world. Now, one of the challenges here that the, you know, sort of the community is wrestling with is, hey, we're social networks, we're Google, Yahoo, we don't have a great way of knowing at this moment who owns a particular phone number. Uh, what we can do is, you know, do a one-time process of confirming, okay, at this moment in time, you know, Frank owned that phone number, um, but I don't know if, you know, he stopped using it five days later. Um, but there's honestly so much pressure from this that most of the social networks are already experimenting with providing the service where they'll do a one-time verification of phone number and once they've done that, they're going to provide these lookup services for you to say, yeah, I want to learn more about the person at, you know, 408-673-1212. Uh, the telcos obviously have much better identity information about who is the current owner of that phone number. And so there's an option to provide some directory service there. Another opportunity to work together. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, and actually, one more slide. Okay, so then let me move on to the last uh, area that I want to talk about, especially during the time we have today, which is uh, the discussion that Mark and some of the others talked about, about how do you get users' data to, to move around the web. And Mark has a great, where's Mark? Mark? Mark has a great slide that I'm going to steal because uh, it's a better intro than I, I used to do. Uh, about, at this point, maybe four years ago, we sort of had a, a version of that same slide problem internally. We said, you know, wow, it's Google. We want to take the data that, you know, we are storing about users, and we want users to take it other places. We think that it could be really valuable. And to be honest, Google, in many cases, wanted to be able to aggregate information about users from other places. So the question was, you know, under what legal framework are people going to be comfortable with this? And when we talked to lawyers and, honestly, regulators, uh, this was around the time when they were beating us up about our uh, storage of search history, you know, th they gave us a lot of crap for this. And so we were like, wow, this is going to be really hard. So he said, what we really need is a use case that the regulators and the politicians and the government could really understand is valuable for moving private user data around. And you know, uh, we just talked about it with AT&T, which was health records. So about four years ago, we started a project called Google Health, uh, where the goal was to prove a model for how users can consent to moving their data between websites, where I literally spent probably 18 months mostly with privacy advocates and regulators you know, around the world, educating them about this model. And it was funny, because I'd, you know, I'd walk into, for example, the CEO of a hospital like Stanford, and I'd say, you know what, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to get to the point where you're going to be willing to give me someone's health information. And I, as Google, I'm not going to even sign a legal contract for you, Stan with you, Stanford. And they looked at me and laughed, right? Uh, I'm doing this now with 100 you know, medical institutions, uh, and we're doing it 
at the technology level using this thing called OAuth, that's a standard. But to be honest, the, the technical part wasn't the hard part. The hard part was convincing you know, policy people, legal people, et cetera, that it is reasonable for users to make the decision to move their data from point A to point B. And you know, what we actually found, again, talking with hospitals, et cetera, their biggest concern wasn't even you know, how to get the user consent and whether the user should be able to send the data somewhere else. The hospitals were concerned that if the user told them to send their data over to service A and service B and service C, what if service B did something really stupid? Is Stanford, response, Stanford Hospital responsible for that? That was actually their, their biggest concern. And Drez, you know, whatever the legal you know, infrastructure says, uh, the, the front page of the New York Times is different, right? So they were worried about that, you know, when that B service screws up, is Stanford gonna end up on the front page of the New York Times for having done something dumb, right? Uh, and that's one where, you know, uh, over time people are getting more and more confidence that, yes, that might show up there, but users in so many different places on the internet are taking responsibility for their data. They're realizing there's, you know, some responsibility goes along with the, that authority. And as we're seeing more, you know, um, you know, sort of social confidence in this mechanism, it's starting to get some of that oil people we're talking about moving in, in more directions. And so like I say, we started this with Google Health just to go after the most extreme use case we could. And once you know, that was working well, we focused on honestly, uh, and now you can move to the next slide, some of the easier data sets. Um, hopefully you guys have all seen pages like these, but this is just an example where uh, in this case, it's sort of Google Health, where a user has aggregated their information to Google and if they want to, you know, and so it's their personal data store, their personal health store, it's their activity stream of their health information. If they want to give consent, once they've aggregated that information to go somewhere else, it's a pretty simple, you know, uh, opt-in, opt-out decision. You know, uh, you're logged in, this other website, and you know, in this case, you know, Health Demo wants access to, you know, your wife's data, your own data, your daughter's data. Is this okay, yes or no, right? Uh, the industry has, in fact, spent a ton of time in just figuring out what should these pages look like, how complicated uh, can they be. Uh, for, for example, we had this funny thing we had called the Google Health Privacy Council, where we had all these privacy experts and CEOs and government officials uh, on a council at Google for two years designing this page. The first version of this page uh, I, it would be really tiny if, if you read it because it had every single wisdom and jig you can imagine and tosses and click boxes and check boxes and you know the privacy experts tell you, you absolutely have to have this, everybody wants this. And what we did for two years is we take their pages, we do usability tests, and then we'd show them videos of the people who mostly were using cuss words to describe <laughs> the pages they decide. And then you know over time got down to something where half of the people would get in and the other half would still swear. We got to the half point, we said, all right, good enough for the health case. For the other scenarios, we're gonna be a little bit more aggressive, right? So that's the type of work that, again, not, by the way, not just Google, other big industry players, you know, whether it's Yahoo, Microsoft, health fault in the health space, but you know, Facebook and social networks have been involved in this. Uh, so next slide. And so you, you see this today, you know, especially used for moving around you know, address books and photos, you know, now, but now it's friends list locations, uh, but even other data sets, you know, credit card purchases and you know, maybe even who you've called. And, and we're seeing this being used in two ways. Most of the ways people see it is when they want to authorize their information at company A to go to company B. But some of the other examples we're seeing are companies who have data about a user, but only have their consent to use it in one fashion or another, and they've been restricted maybe by legal regulations, by their terms of service, et cetera. Uh, a lot of times, large companies, they don't even have a, a single login system across all the different services they could offer users. So many companies are even using this type of um, infrastructure, these techniques we refer to as OAuth, to get the user's permission to use their existing data that the company has in new ways, even if the new way is you know, with another service of a company they bought you know, two weeks ago who doesn't have a single login system. So it's just a, a mechanism you can follow where you can point your lawyers and you know, the policy people at a lot of other examples you know, that went ahead of you uh, and took some of the hits. And you know, like I say, hopefully use that both to you know, take the data that you have about users, use it in new ways, enable them to use it in new ways, as well as aggregate maybe some information you don't have about users from other sources and then combine it for some interesting ways. Uh, so um, if you want to reach me, to, I'm, I'm low tech. I don't, I don't actually use social networks much, even though I do most of the identity work for them. So that's my email address. <laughs> my Twitter handle would be like ESAC692. I don't know why that's cool, but all right. And, 
Uh, Don, who hopefully most of you all know, Don and I are on the board of both the OpenID Foundation and the OIX Foundation. If you want to meet you know, other key identity players in the big companies, that, that's the best place to go. You know, get involved in those organizations. I'll be honest, pony up some money to pay for Don, who's you know, a dedicated person who spends a lot of time talking to industry analysts, privacy people, government people, et cetera, you know, getting them to understand that you know, this is a model that's been working very well and can be used in other fashions. And you know, Kalia and some of the others also run the Internet Identity Workshop, which is another uh, good place to meet in person with people. There's one next week. Uh, up in the Bay Area, Tuesday through Thursday. We have it twice a year. We also have them in the East Coast, and now one in Europe, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you know, so feel free to email me if there are opportunities to work together. The work that I do doesn't succeed if only Google does it. It's only helpful if I do it with others. So feel free to email me, and if there are other people you want to talk to in the community, like I said, you know, these are some of the best forums to use for that purpose. Great. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.